right, this lesson is about polynomial and rational inequalities. Last week we learned about quadratic inequalities, and we learned a method of solving them by using graphing. We could also solve polynomial and rational inequalities by graphing, but they are more difficult to graph. So we are going to learn another method today um, using points and testing intervals, uh, setting up a table of values. Well, you'll see what I mean in just a minute. Okay, the first step to solving these rational and polynomial inequalities is number one, take your function, or it's actually not written as a function, it'll be written as an equation. That means it won't have an f of x in it, it will have one variable with an equal sign, and you want to move everything onto the left side, the right, yeah, the left side of the equal sign with zero on the right side. And actually, because it's inequalities, I'm wrong, it won't be an equal sign. It will be a less than, or a greater than, or a less than and equal to, or a greater than and equal to, one of those. Okay, so again, step one. Write everything on the left side of the sign. And when I'm talking about sign, I'm talking about our inequality signs. So if you have to move something over to the left side, you would have to do the opposite. If it's adding, you subtract it. If it's subtracting, you add it, etc. Okay? The next step is to find what we call critical values. Okay. Critical values are x-intercepts. The reason x-intercepts are critical values is because that's where a graph switches from above the x-axis or positive to below the x-axis or negative. So that's where it becomes greater than or less than zero and that situation changes. So x-intercepts are critical values where that can happen. Another place where our graph can change so that it's positive when it used to be negative or negative when it used to be positive are at asymptotes. So asymptotes are also critical values. The last one you want to watch for are holes in the graph and we talked about that in our previous section of stuff that sometimes we can have holes in a graph without there actually being an asymptote there. And that would just be places that make the denominator zero, but that end up getting factored and reduced out of the problem that we were originally given. Okay, next step. We are then going to set up a table of intervals. Intervals are groups of numbers with a starting and an ending point and it gives you a range of values. Uh, um, you know, not just one number, but the number can be from this point to that point. So each interval has a starting and an ending point that includes that interval of values. Set up a table of intervals. Okay, when we set up our table of intervals, we are going to select points to test, we're going to evaluate those points, and we're going to determine if they are negative or positive. Okay. So let's look at how to create this table. 
Um, our table would probably include the intervals that we're dealing with. You can have anywhere from two to infinitely many intervals. Not infinite, I'm kidding. But starting with two intervals and going up to however many there are. Generally there will be more than two though. Usually at least three. But even a problem could have only two. Your intervals will not always start, you always want to start at the left side of your number line and go to the right side of the number line. So the first interval should start at negative infinity to some number. And then depending on if it's less than or greater than or less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, that will determine whether this is a parenthesis or a bracket. Okay? Then you take the number that you ended with here and go to another number, which is our critical values. These numbers in here are your critical values. Then you start off with that number. So let's call that critical value 1. And let's call this critical number 2. And you might have a critical number 3. Or you might only have two critical values. In that case, the, your ending interval would end at infinity. So what I'm kind of showing here would have three intervals, but there could be more than that. Then you're going to choose a number that's within that interval. This is where students tend to make the most mistakes. You have to choose a number that's inside of this interval. If this is going from negative infinity to negative 3, you cannot choose 0. Because 0 is not in that interval. You would have to choose a number that's in the interval. And it cannot be the critical numbers. So let's write that down. Can't be critical values. It has to be something else inside the interval. So if that was a negative 3, we could use negative 4. Um, if this one went from a negative 3 to a positive 1, then we could use 0. Always use 0 when you can, because it's an easy one to use. And then here we would have to choose a number if this went to positive 1, and then positive 1 to infinity, we would have to choose a number that's in that interval, such as positive 2. After you choose the numbers in your intervals, you plug the numbers in into the equation you're working with. And you evaluate it, and you figure out whether the answer is positive or negative. And you would write those details in this line of the table, positive or negative. The reason that we care about whether it's positive or negative is that if it's positive, it's greater than. If it's negative, it's less than. So it all hinges on the fact that we're doing inequalities. Okay? Then the last thing to do is use that information to figure out the solution. write it down. So like if this had been a problem that I wanted to be greater than and I got an answer here that was positive and an answer here that's negative and an answer here that's positive, greater than would be positive. So therefore my answer would be this interval and this interval. If it was a less than problem and this was positive, negative, positive, then the answer would be this interval less than would be the negative interval. So instead of doing by graphing like we did in section 4.5, we are doing this using a table of values so there is no graphing involved at all. Some of you like graphing, some of you don't. But if you don't like graphing, then this method is for you. You can also, so I'm just going to write down what I said earlier. These can also be solved by graphing. like we did in section 4.5 where we did just quadratic graphs and we figured out whether the graph was above or below the x-axis and above the x-axis is greater than or greater than or equal to 
and below the x-axis was less than or less than and equal to, and we used that method. So if you want to, you can use this to check your answer on this. You've kind of got a, a fallback way of making sure you're getting these correct, especially on a test.